Hello, hello, and welcome back to another video. My name is Cindy. I am a fourth year MD PhD student, and on my channel, we talk about research, academia, my experience in medical school, and also the application process. Today, I'll be reacting to a video that I saw floating around. It's by a fellow content creator here on YouTube. His name is Danny Lee, and he goes over his application process and why, despite having a super high MCAT score and a high GPA, he unfortunately did not get into med school. I think he ultimately decided that medical school is not for him but i think he makes some really good points and i will be going over some of his points in more detail so that you know what to do with your application and so you can maximize your chances at getting into medical school and so without further ado let's get started so i did not get into med school and this is despite a 395 undergrad gpa and a 527 on my mcat which definitely qualified me to apply to all the top schools. So what happened? What went wrong? And how can you learn from my mistakes? I'm going to break that all down right now, all the red flags in my application. But first, a little bit of background. I'm an economics undergrad student. I did my pre-med post back, and then I did a master's in music school. So it's a bit of a non-traditional path, but that can actually be an advantage. If so he's definitely right that having a pretty non-traditional path can help you. And I would say that my background is actually kind of similar to his. My undergrad major was in statistics, and then I was also very, very involved in music. I did not end up getting a songwriting master's or a master's related to music, but I have a music minor and a lot of my extracurriculars that I did in undergrad was music related. And he is completely right that having a non-traditional path does not harm you in any way. In fact, if you spin it right, it can really help you. I specifically remember for my Columbia interview, all my interviewer wanted to talk about was what I played at my senior recital, and we just talked for 30 minutes about that. The first red flag was my submission timing. You can see here that I did submit my primary application uh, just a few days after it opened, and it took six weeks to get processed. Still very early in the cycle, no problem here. But my secondaries were a different story. It's recommended that you submit your secondaries within two weeks after receiving them. All the prompts are usually carried over from the year before, so you can pre-write them during your primary processing period. But I submitted my secondaries between six to eight weeks later, and I'll talk about why in a minute. So let's talk a little bit about the primary application first. Why is it important to submit that early? Well, primarily it is because medical schools run on a rolling application basis. So even though they say that you can technically submit things until something like December 31st or something like that, you do not want to be doing that because you want your application near the top of the pile because as they review down the pile, that's how they decide who to send out interview invites to. And as they send out interview invites, they give out acceptances and things like that. And it's all on a rolling basis. And then for the primary application process, it's not so easy as just hitting submit and having all of your information transmitted to the schools. Typically, the application will start letting you submit sometimes in late May, early June, but it will take several weeks for your application to be verified or kind of processed. So that verification process takes a couple weeks, and you can imagine if you submit it late, and everyone's trying to submit it at the same time, then the verification process is gonna take even longer. I think the MCAS says like it can take up to eight weeks or something if you submit it during like peak season. So most students will try their best to submit within the first two weeks of the application opening. If you submit really early, actually the verification process is a little bit faster for you. And then from there, there is a date called transmission date. The transmission date is the first date that schools will know of your existence. The first day that schools can receive your application all the applications that are verified prior to transmission date will be sent to the schools on transmission date. And then all of the applications that are verified after the transmission date will just be sent to the schools as soon as they are verified. With the secondary applications, you cannot get them until the schools know of your existence. So schools will not be sending you secondaries until they receive your primary application. And schools will not review your application until your entire secondary application is complete. So again, rolling basis, the people who are getting in early, they're submitting their primaries, they're submitting their secondaries, um, they will get reviewed by the schools first. They are the first people that the school will consider sending out interview invites to. And you can imagine if you're at the bottom of the pile, maybe the school never 
never gets your application. There is kind of a soft rule that you should submit secondaries within two weeks of receiving them. I do generally agree with that rule, but I think it can cause a lot of anxiety with pre-meds, especially as a ton of secondaries start rolling in all at once in like the first week or two of July. So that I just say, try your best to get it in within two weeks. If it's 15 days, don't worry about it. But if you're pushing a month, that's probably taking a little too long. And I definitely agree with Danny's advice to pre-write. All of the prompts are usually floating around on the internet somewhere. And you can typically write kind of the most popular prompts. So like the diversity essays, adversity essays, um, challenges, what you did in your gap year. Those are all topics that come up again and again and again. And if you kind of come up with a template for yourself, you can just kind of cater that to each school as they come in so it won't be so bad. And you can do that while you wait for your application. All right, so that's a long explanation, maybe kind of complicated. I will be trying to write a blog post on this and throw it up. So that link will be down in the description below. But yes, let's get back to the video. All right, now my second red flag was my clinical experience. What admissions committees are looking for is demonstrated commitment to medicine. They want to know that you know exactly what you're getting into. Now let's take a look at my app. I worked as an EMT for a few months and then I did some shadowing here and some volunteering here and not much else. So that definitely raised a few questions. Um, what was up with this huge gap in my clinical experience? Here is the real unfiltered truth. I don't enjoy clinical work at all. I paused the video here um, just to take a better look at what his hours looked like and what the dates looked like. Because from kind of the first listen of this video and like the quick screenshots that he showed, I didn't really think there was that big of a problem with it. I personally thought the hours looked totally fine. And I am actually not super sure if it truly is a red flag to have like kind of a gap of time between the clinical experiences. It kind of makes me wonder how these clinical experiences showed up in his essays and how he wrote about them in his application because he does go on to say that he doesn't enjoy clinical work and I just wonder if that showed up in some of his writing. That's kind of my opinion on it. And this reminded me of a conversation I had with a pre-med recently and they were asking me, oh, like how many hours is enough hours of clinical experience? And I always tell people that, you know, it's not actually about the number of hours. It's whether or not you're able to write meaningfully about this activity and this clinical experience on your applications. And so if you're sitting around thinking, hey, like, do I have enough hours of clinical experience? Don't think so much in terms of the hours, but think more in terms of like, am I able to write about this meaningfully? My research. Although I had a lot of research hours, I only had one third author publication. So this helped me a little bit maybe, but overall my experiences don't really demonstrate any sort of commitment to medicine. He has about 1,500 hours of research and a third author publication. And here I want to actually bring up another point um, specifically for my MD-PhD applicants. I know Danny didn't apply to MD-PhD, but this is just kind of like my additional commentary on this. A lot of students wonder, do I have to have a publication in order to be competitive for MD-PhD or do I need a first author publication to be competitive for MD-PhD? And I think the answer is no, but a publication will certainly help you. For MD -PhD, specifically what you want to demonstrate is that you have been productive so whether that be a poster a presentation and they're also looking to see if you're able to talk about your project in a scientific and meaningful way and you're able to describe your research and your contributions to it and I think this is kind of similar for medical school admissions like you don't need a publication in order to be competitive for medical school and I actually think a third author publication is totally great and it definitely is helpful I actually think I think in this case, even though he kind of framed it like it might have been not a great look to have 1500 hours of research but only a third author publication, I actually think in this case it was probably beneficial. But of course it will also depend on how somebody writes about their research on their application. So that's a piece of the puzzle that we don't necessarily have. The third red flag was in my writing. My primary, I talk about my motivations for um, being a doctor and my journey through like music and medicine and this was pretty good like I, I felt good about my primary but again my secondaries were a real issue. Now 
what schools expect to see in your secondaries is kind of a development of your character, drawing from clinical experiences, experiences with patients, maybe a little bit of research. Um, and I realized I just didn't have any of these really meaningful clinical experiences. And I ended up writing about music and music school. I think Danny in this case has really good insight on what went wrong in his application. And while he paused on the screen of his primary, I did look at his personal statement as well. I feel like from reading that, even just briefly, I think he could have added more meaningful clinical anecdotes as well to that um, primary essay. What schools ultimately want to see with your essays is they want to know why you want to be a doctor. And you want to try to illustrate that as specific as possible with anecdotes, experiences, and things like that, rather than just a general narrative of answering the question, why do I want to be a doctor? Like you need anecdotes to support that statement. And actually when I mentor pre-meds and they show me their primary application, um, a lot of times what is missing is these very specific anecdotes that support why they want to be a doctor. Of course I know you want to be a doctor, you're applying to medical school, but you can't just tell me that I want to be a doctor. You can't just say like vague statements of like, you know, I want to help people and I like science, which is almost what everyone says. I want to see kind of specific interactions that you've had in the past that has helped you get on this path to wanting to be a doctor. I had some less than noble motivations for wanting to be a medical student, including the status and the validation of being in med school. I was pretty much prepared to drop out uh, if any other opportunity presented itself, like if my creative career took off. And I was actually so unmotivated that I didn't even finish all of my secondaries. He said that he did not finish 11 out of 23 of his secondaries, which is significant. And that means that he only applied to 12 schools in the end. Only 12 schools reviewed his application, which definitely would have hurt his chances in my opinion. I think typically these days people apply upwards of 30 different schools. I applied to 20, either 20 or 25, I don't quite remember anymore. But I would say a good number to aim for is at least 20. And you want to be able to finish all of these secondaries within that, you know, two-ish week mark. I want to just give Danny a big kudos about this very insightful breakdown of his own application because, you know, it's hard to look back at something and really make this in-depth analysis the way that he did. For me personally, I feel like his numbers were totally fine. Obviously, he knocked the MCAT out of the park. He has a great GPA. And I wouldn't even say that from, you know, like the brief glances of his primary application that we saw that his clinical hours are bad or anything. I think they were just fine. But I do agree with him. The two things that were probably the red flags of his application was the timing. Like he should have finished all of his secondaries within that two-ish week mark. That definitely would have helped. And secondly, I think it could have been the writing. And I'm personally curious as well whether or not he ended up getting any interviews from the 12-ish schools that did review his application. And if he did and he didn't get any acceptances, like maybe it could be the interviews as well. So yeah, I will be linking his video down below, of course. And I also have made a kind of my journey video about how I got into an MD-PhD program, which I will also link down below. Thank you so much for watching. And if you found this video helpful in any way, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Feel free to leave me questions um, or video suggestions on what you would like me to talk about next. And obviously, thank you so much, Danny, for making this video. I think this is incredibly helpful for pre-meds to kind of go through an in-depth analysis of your application. I wish you the best of luck in whatever you choose to pursue next. And with that, I will end this video here and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye!